the Anglo-Palestine Bank renamed itself after the State of Israel was established, and the name is now Bank Lumi. Same bank. Anglo-Palestine Bank would take that money, credit through an international clearinghouse, the, uh, the uh, German um, trust fund. The German trust fund would issue uh, the um, foreign currency of 1,000 British pounds. A capitalist certificate would be given to the German Jew, and that German Jew would then come across. And in many times, he came across with replicas of his own home. He came across with carpets. He came across with, um, uh, with uh, building materials. He came across with cars. He came across with musical in instruments. And suddenly, there was a massive German Jewish and infrastructural and economic infusion into Jewish Palestine. So let me ask you. Uh, it's complex. OK, leaving aside the complexity, let me just ask a simple question then. Was this then? Uh, uh, a situation whereby the Jewish community and somehow was contributing to the Nazi efforts and, and, and helping to finance what it is that they wanted to be able to do. Yeah. And that, and, and that must have been also one of the uh, causes for such an explosive reaction to your book, right? Yeah. yeah. It's a deal with the devil, not, not with the angels. It's a deal with the people who want to kill you. So basically, every time they rescued a Jew, mm -hmm. they paid into the Nazi economy. <laughs> and it's worse than that. I mean, there were many dynamics that I never even wrote about, but the Jews were compelled. The Jews were compelled to rescue Jews in this fashion. It was a terrible uh, a choice to have to make. It's a, it was a terrible choice that was thrust upon the Jews, but you do not, uh, upon the Zionists, but you do not blame the uh, the hostage did, with the gun at their forehead. Did the Zionists consult with anybody on this, or they just said, you know what, we've got to do this, and this is what we're going to, we need to do. And did they talk with the American Jewish Committee or Congress? I, I mean, I assume I know the answer. They, they just, you know, went on their own. Is that right? They didn't care about the American Jewish Committee. Right. Uh, in fact, Zionism was controlled out of London until this time. Mm -hmm. And by the time uh, uh, the transfer agreement came to the fore, the access point for uh, uh, Zionist um, uh, authority had transferred to Jerusalem. And so the people on the ground in Jerusalem were making decisions. And they weren't just taking anyone on a first come, first serve basis. They were actually concomitantly building the state of Israel. And so consequently, they, they took the people who had a chance of surviving Okay. in Jewish Palestine, not just anyone. When we've, when we've used this term, the Zionists, that's the Zionist leaders, the Jewish nationalists, any particular leaders in, in, uh, uh, that, 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 were, uh, uh, that we know of who were uh, um, involved in advocating for this? Yes, the entire Jewish agency. We're talking David Ben-Gurion. We are talking wow. about another gray, not black and white fabric. Mm -hmm. Just as I said, the American Jewish community was divided between uh, these two different blocks. In the Zionist community also there were. The power. Zionist community was also they not monolithic. Uh -huh. There was what was called at that time the Labor Party, the, Ma the, the, Ma the Mabai Party. Sure. You're talking about people like Ben-Gurion. You're talking about a guy by the name of Chaim Arlazarov. Sure. Everybody who's been to Israel has been down the street called Arlazarov. Absolutely right. And Arlazarov was the chief engineer of this agreement, mm -hmm. and he was murdered for it on the beach in Tel Aviv at the location where the Hilton now stands mm -hmm. uh, in Tel Aviv, sure. right there. There was no Hilton there at that time. And he was killed presumably by uh, the followers of the dissident Zionist faction. And that dissident Zionist faction was led by a group associated with Menachem Begin, but really associated with uh, Jabotinsky. The revisionists. And they called themselves revisionists. And the term revisionist at that time meant we have a new idea for uh, Zionism. And these were the fighting Zionists. These were the Zionists who, <coughs> who said, we want to fight Hitler. We don't want to have a deal with him. And consequently, 
as the Jewish community was torn apart on the uh, uh, subsuming and subverting the uh, the boycott, the Zionist community was fighting. They had riots. They had um, uh, contentious votes. They, they 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 were tearing their hearts out, saying, "How can we cut a deal with these Nazis?" Because right now it's common to say uh, the Nazis weren't thinking of extermination. I've gone into the record. My first use of the word, uh, my first common use of the word extermination in Nazi literature goes back to 1933. And that's because that was the word they used in, in World War I to exterminate the, Ar the Armenians, mm -hmm. was extermination. So consequently, it was uh, a word of parlance of the day and the Zionists completely expected everything that happened because they had a complete grasp on Jewish history, uh, on the worthlessness of Jewish life at, at the hands of murderers. They had seen many, many Jews die in Eastern Europe and in other parts of the world. So, so I want to fast forward now. We're talking about the controversy that occurred then. We're talking about the, we're talking about the controversy about the book um, on a personal level. Uh, exposing this, dealing with this, writing about this, uh, obviously must have been uh, uh, a, a lot of, uh, well, I don't know what to say, uh, whether it was ad hominems, attacks, or whatever. What was it like when the book first came out on, for you in that context? Well, this was my first book. I was only, um, you know, I was in my 20s when I started it. Uh, it came out in 1984. Um, I, I had been the editor of a, of a, a city magazine, but I'd never been in, I, I, exposed on the international stage. Uh, the book was published uh, um, uh, world, worldwide, and um, uh, people were shocked, surprised, confused. Uh, there was a town hall meeting set up in Chicago to discuss this. And it was supposed to be in some little uh, JCC uh, uh, social room. And by uh, 1 o'clock, so many people had made reservation. They moved it to, uh, to a large synagogue. And then they moved it to a football stadium. <laughs> and I had 1,100 people waiting to hear me uh, talk about this. And um, uh, it was rough. There were people who. Uh, uh, they said that Muammar Gaddafi was financing me. I had picket lines. They said my parents were from Kuwait. Of course, they're Polish survivors. Um, they um, hired psychologists to psychoanalyze me. Why am I doing this book? But ultimately, the test of time, the historical veracity, the truth of the book. Were you, uh, were, were, were you surprised, or did you anticipate that it may have that kind of reaction, by the way? I, was, I anticipated because that was my reaction. Okay. I hated the project. But you like the book? Well, I wrote the book. Rewrite the book. The book had to be written, and I, and, I wrote it, and I wrote it. So it was a story you felt had to be told? Yeah, I was on a, a, a quest. To, uh, so, so It was trial by fire for my first book. Uh, it prepared me well for IBM and the Holocaust. Did, so were you surprised as you were doing your research with where you got, in other words, or, or when you started it, did you think it would... Uh, reveal what you ultimately learned about the, 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 the whole uh, setup. The entire book covers the minute-by-minute minute developments in three countries accounting for time zone shifts mm -hmm. in Jewish Palestine, Germany, and the United States. We have diplomatic uh, 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 messages going mm -hmm. back and forth, and it only covers the first eight months of 1933. It's very, very intense. Um, it accomplished what I wanted to do, which is to understand what had happened. And um, so you went into it wanting to understand. But my question is, did, did, were you surprised by the conclusion, or you kind of, as you started to get into it, see where I it was never taking wanted it? to find the conclusion that I had. Okay. Okay. It was okay. pretty. It was. It was pretty wide, and uh, it's kind of like that with a lot of my books. Uh, I never believe how far it's going to go. And uh, I take it to the end of the factual line. Uh, I, I remember you're telling me about the IBM book, 
and saying you just stood at the Holocaust Museum staring at the uh, IBM mach uh, machine there and wondering, the computer, why is that there? So I know that you just process it and think about it. What were, uh, uh, tell us about some, what would be, uh, uh, when it first had come out, the, the worst moment, your, your most gratifying moment as well, just to... Well, the worst moment, the worst moment, what was the worst moment? Um, the worst moment was probably um, when um, I had a guy, uh, there were people uh, uh, attending my, uh, one of my lectures, uh, he was an undertaker, and uh, he said to my parents, we want to bury your son's book. Wow. And the best moment was when I won the Carl Sandburg Award from sure. the best book of the year, and I uh, became a cost celeb in the Jewish media, and from there I developed a syndicated column mm -hmm. in, um, um, in 50 Jewish newspapers on the strength of the transcript. The Jewish media actually, well, I didn't even know there was a Jewish media. I didn't know there were, at that time, Jewish newspapers right. in every city, and the Jewish newspapers plastered this all over and gave it a great deal of credence, and it gave me entree uh, to uh, pursue my wider mission of uh, exposing injustice against the Jews, uh, Holocaust factuality and verity, and to do the other things that I've done. So it really launched your career. You went on, you became a columnist in Jewish newspapers as well as, I believe, for the Jerusalem Post and elsewhere. Yes, uh, I was syndicated throughout the world. In fact, uh, Louis Farrakhan granted me the first interview um, uh, um, to uh, the, the first interview for a Jewish journalist uh -huh. uh, because he had, he had read the transfer agreement. Interesting. And um, based on that book, he actually made a statement, often uh, quoted, uh, Jews have a gutter religion, uh, the yeah. Jews made a deal with the Nazis, and I and this know. This is what he's referring to? Yeah, when he and says I know because the Jewish author wrote it. Ah. And so there are a lot of um, uh, antagonists who use this information to invalidate the Jewish state and who used this information falsely to, um, uh, to claim that the Holocaust did not exist. It, it, it's just, but these same people will use the Bible, the biography of Golda Meir, the, biography, the autobiography of Ben-Gurion, uh, mm -hmm. Moshe Dayan. They will use anything that, that, that they have. And they are frustrated by the fact that I have brought out the truth, which is that the Jews, that the Zionists rescued Jews. Now, there were transfer agreements in other, in other countries. There was the potentiality of rescuing millions of Jews. Millions of Jews could have been rescued. You have to ask yourself whether or not the Nazis would have been stopped by people <coughs> running up and down the street with placards or whether it took something more. The Zionists were the only realists of the time. And by the way, there was no country. There was no major corporation. There was no major or, or organization that did not have vibrant relations, commercial and diplomatic, with the Nazis at that time. So let me ask you a question. Uh, your website lists uh, the many uh, different books you've uh, written on, uh, topics you've talked about, whether it's oil addiction, whether it's uh, uh, the Holocaust, whether, uh, uh, other, other topics. If I'm not mistaken, this is not one that you usually talk about. Right. Uh, I do about 300 events a year. I talk about IBM and the Holocaust. I talk about oil addiction, uh, Nazi Nexus, all of these books. I don't talk about the transfer agreement. Uh, it almost seems to me, if I can say this, I don't want to be uh, psychoanalyzing you said before, almost like you have a love-hate relationship with it. Yeah, I do. Yeah. Um, I always tell people, read this book last. Mm -hmm. I've, I've, I've got eight, 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 nine books. In fact, uh, I told a reviewer from the Miami Herald, uh, if you review this book, you're going to hate it. It's not a comfortable book to read. Well, it was a less comfortable book to write. But the Holocaust is not comfortable. And the truth is never comfortable. Now, in the, uh, the, the, the uh, back of the book, as well as in the, uh, uh, when you signed it, and, and you did this for me as well, you wrote, uh, you asked the question, was it madness or was it genius? Yeah. Um, you want to shed any light on that? Do you want to? Well, 
all genius is based on madness. Mm -hmm. So it was both. Mm -hmm. Well, it's a, it's a brilliant work and uh, an important one. Uh, what I want to do now is I want to turn things over to uh, Mitchell Bard, uh, who is going uh, uh, to uh, share with us some questions that some other scholars have submitted. Um, and uh, we'll take it from there. Well, it's hard to know where to start with, uh, with this subject, but uh, Martin Gilbert, who has uh, you know is uh, Winston Churchill's biographer, uh, and he's the author of a number of books on the Holocaust and author of a forthcoming book on Muslim rules of 1,400-year history. He wrote, what do you think would have been the impact on the Israeli ability to absorb Holocaust survivors in the 1940s had the transfer agreement not occurred in the 1930s? The main value of the transfer agreement, this 1.9, 1 1.4 to 1.7 to 1.9 billion dollars, equivalent dollars in uh, today's money that was transferred o over, was not trinkets. It was fundamentally infrastructure. When uh, Jews came over uh, during the uh, Hitler period and uh, en masse and after the fall of the Third Reich, they, co they came over in huge waves. Where were they going to live? What water were, the, were, were, were they going to use? What, what were, where were the roads going to be? Um, where, where were the lands? Um, had the transfer agreement never occurred in, 1930, in the 1930s, there would not have been the infrastructure to rapidly um, absorb all of these Jews. Let's, let's remember this. The, not, the Nazi program was continued, as you well know, uh, after World War II um, uh, by the Arabs. Uh, they expelled approximately a million Jews uh, from Arab lands uh, in the years after the fall of the Third Reich. These people were not put into refugee camps. They were, quick, they were quickly, quickly absorbed. The name of the immigration ministry in Israel is called the Ministry of, of Absorption. And they absorbed these people. And so the answer to uh, Martin Gilbert is that uh, had um, uh, Israel, uh, the state of Israel, not been aided with this import important impetus during the Depression years, uh, it would have been, I think, difficult to absorb hundreds of thousands of Jews who came en masse during the years to follow. And this was, in fact, anticipated. We have another question from uh, Professor Samuel Edelman in Chico, California, who's the executive director of Scholars for Peace in the Middle East. He asks, there were other transfer agreements across Europe, such as one in Czechoslovakia, Romania, Hungary. Why didn't those succeed in transferring more Jews to Palestine? Well, this is true. There was a transfer agreement uh, uh, in Italy. There was a transfer agreement in Czechoslovakia, in, in Romania. They each had their own financing schemes. And as the situation became more dire for the Jews in Europe, remember Hitler went into Czechoslovakia and he went into Austria and he began to take over Europe, the Zionists rushed frantically to set up more transfer agreements to save the Jews because you must remember this very important statement, and I will quote you a phrase you know well, that Chaim Weizmann said, the world is divided into two places, those places where Jews cannot live and those places where Jews cannot go. There were, most people think that Evian is just water you buy at the store. The Evian conference lives with us in 1938 as what to do with hundreds of thousands of refugees where the doors were shut. So Palestine was the only door open to the Jews. They weren't allowed into, uh, uh, into most of the nations of the world. So these transfer agreements had the possibility to transfer hundreds of thousands of more Jews. Romania, Hungary, most of the Hungarian Jews were wiped out uh, in transports. Uh, they were organized by, uh, in Hungary by the, um, one of the members of the board of directors of IBM, Ed, Ed, Edmund Wiesenmeyer. And imagine if these uh, Jews had come by the boatload, literally, into Jewish Palestine. What happened? The war happened. Economic stopped. International trade became Ill, 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 illegal. And the Zionists were not able to continue 
transferring these monies out in an effective and meaningful fashion. And so the war caught up with the transfer agreement before the transfer agreement could catch up with the genocide. Professor Byron Sherwin of Spurtis College, the author of many books on ethics and most recently uh, The Life Worth Living, uh, who was also, you mentioned the, the scholar who first told you about the transfer agreement, asks, uh, you first heard about the agreement in an interview you did with me in the 1970s. I recall that when I told you about it in very general terms, you found it hard to believe that it actually happened. Now, after all your research, writing, and thinking about it, do you still find it hard to believe that it happened? I didn't believe it happened in those days because I wasn't smart enough to know that it happened. I wasn't wise enough to know. Uh, I'd barely been out of Chicago. Uh, the march in question was one in Skokie, where, where my parents lived. It was just outside. What do, if I was presented with this information now, I would believe it in an instant. I would have never believed that IBM would have had a 12-year um, uh, pact uh, a, a widespread commercial coalition with the Third Reich to identify the Jews and even to create the basis of the Auschwitz tattoo. I would have never believed that the Rockefeller Foundation would have financed a program that sent Mengele into Auschwitz. I believe all of these things now, and I believe them because of the trial by fire that I had when I did the transfer agreement. Professor Sherwin offers a second and very penetrating question. If the revision of Zionists led by Vladimir Jabotinsky and Menachem Begin had been controlling the Jewish agency instead of Chaim Sorov, would there have been a transfer agreement? Would there have been German reparations to the State of Israel in the 1950s? And what, what might have been the economic and political outcomes for the State of Israel in its very early history? Well, I'm often asked, I'm constantly asked what if questions on the transfer agreement. What if the boycott had succeeded? What if the transfer agreement had never been there? But here's one I think I can answer. And it's very dangerous. If is the, is the sketchiest word in history. What if? I believe if the revisionists had controlled the uh, transfer agreement, the uh, Jewish agency at the time, uh, I doubt very strongly that there would have been a transfer agreement with the Nazis. Now, it's important for me to explain here uh, the, uh, the delicate fabrics of the revisionist movement. They had actually good relations with the fascist Italian regime because they believed in a, a, a very strict organization. They believed in, in, in that, but I do not believe, based upon the uh, immense a uh, vituperative reaction of the revisionists that they would have ever allowed uh, the Zionist organization and movement to cut a deal with the Nazis. They would have rather fought them, and they did fight them. And by the way, from that you can extrapolate on your own what the economic consequences would be. Now, would there have been reparations to Israel? Those reparations were actually calculated in 1938 by um, Nachum Goldman. I had access to his unprocessed papers at the American Jewish Archives in 1938. And 1938, before the war broke out, years before Auschwitz was established, the Zionists were already uh, uh, anticipating the worst. Why? Because they were realists. Because when Hitler said we're going to destroy the Jews, they actually paid attention. And they actually went out and did mathematical calculations on uh, Nachum Goldman. I have the report. Um, I've never mentioned it until this moment. On what the anticipated destruction, economic and human, would be if Hitler succeeded. And Hitler almost succeeded. He succeeded 99% in many countries. And uh, he was stopped, but just barely. You, you mentioned 1938. Uh, that was also the year of Kristallnacht. We're coming up on the 71st anniversary in another week or so. And you wrote a distinguished book on Kristallnacht. Right. And one of the things I found in my book, 48 Hours on Kristallnacht, uh, was that even after seeing what went on, the US government wasn't willing to actively rescue Jews. What did you find in your book and your research about the U.S. government's position back in 
33 in the time of this agreement? Well, I think that the doors cl began closing for the Jews very quickly uh, after uh, the first months of 1933. Um, uh, there were refugees everywhere. We're talking about South Africa. We're talking about um, we're talking about uh, Australia. We're talk. Uh, it was very common for Jews in Germany to escape to Austria. And in 1938, they went from Austria to Czechoslovakia, and then the Germans followed them there. And from Czechoslovakia, they went to France, and then the fr the Germans took over France, and uh, in a bifurcated fashion. And um, so it, it was, uh, the Jews, when Chaim Weizmann said, the world is divided into places where Jews are not allowed to be and not allowed to go, it was the reality. And this was the, uh, uh, this was the dire challenge of the Zionists. Rem there's an important dichotomy here. Are we going to make an effort to, to restore Jewish civil rights or to rescue Jews for national rights. Either you're going to take a dollar to keep a Jew where he is and help him get through the starvation imposed upon him. We're going to take a dollar and transfer him. This is real pol politic. Remember, even the um, relief packages that were given to uh, German Jews to uh, get through starvation, those also went into the German economy. Those, it, this is too complex to be black and white and too complex for, um, it was almost too complex for me. That's why it took about five years to figure out. Walid Ferris in Washington, D.C., who is an expert on Middle East affairs and the author of The Confrontation, Winning the War Against Future Jihad, asks, what do you, uh, what do you think would have been the impact or lack of it on the Israeli economy and modern Israel if there had never been a transfer agreement? There are many institutions today, such as Mekarot, the water company, which are taken for granted. These are infrastructural companies. And these companies occurred due to the investment that came, o came over the transfer of assets. Now, it's common for some people to say, well, the transfer agreement did not rescue people, it rescued money. That's not true. It rescued people. It's true that the rescue of the individuals was metered out in cadence with the purchase and distribution of Nazi goods. But the fact of the matter is they had to buy these goods in order to, res to rescue the, pe the, uh, the, pe the, pe the people. Now, what's interesting is when the Jews were in concentration camps, they didn't say, I'm German. They didn't say, I'm Polish. They said, I'm a Zionist. I wish to live. And the Zionists endorsed that. Jews have a right to live, and they save the remnant, and they save the remnant with the gun to the head. And that gun has never been removed from the temple, even though it's gone an inch or two away. The gun is still always cocked. And if I could just put a, a, an asterisk in for modern times, we still have today the Iranians trying to do in 12 minutes what Hitler could not do in 12 years, which is wipe out the Jews. And so the Zionists understood that there needs to be a strong Jewish state so that Jews have the same national aspirations other groups do. And Martin Cohen, a student in Jerusalem, asks, why did so many other historians fail to write about the transfer agreement and the anti-Nazi boycott? They didn't want to. Uh, the transfer agreement was uh, understood. Uh, there were several treatises in uh, German and in Hebrew uh, academic circles. It's not like today, where somebody does a master's thesis and puts it up on the internet, and suddenly a million people have, ha have, have access to it. When I went to the Leo Beck Institute in, in New York, and I looked at the user guide, uh, the finder's aid, and I said, where are the, uh, I, I said, the files are supposed to be in this folder. Where are they? They're not in this file. They're not in this cabinet. Where are they? He said, they're underneath my desk. And he gave them t to me. Um, uh, the book tried to do what many historians do, does not seek to do, which is to be um, uh, uh, all-encompassing on a narrow topic instead of doing a, a, a very slender matter. And so I had to work not in one or two archives, but in 
um, 20 or 30, and I had to put all this together. And this was how I be, this was the invention of the Edwin Black approach to, uh, uh, to Holocaust documentation. Never to look at one place, but 20 places, and to put it all together in a, in a giant puzzle. But the short answer is why they didn't want to, why, why they didn't do it, they didn't want to. James Matthews. And by the way, yes. I didn't want to. I could see why, uh, given the, the uncomfort of the whole subject. Uh, James Matthews in Sydney is a reader who wrote, uh, could the worldwide anti-Nazi boycott have toppled the Hitler regime if not undermined by the Zionists or if it was endorsed by the Zionists? It's another one of these what-if questions that is impossible to answer and inappropriate to answer, but I'll try. The boycott would not have been, was not capable of toppling the German regime. Because remember, we're talking about a regime, people who quote statistics on the German economy don't know what they're talking about. This was an illegal, corrupt economy that stole other people's money as their own economic wherewithal. When they stopped stealing it from their citizens, they stole it from neighboring countries. It was a fascist economy. So it, it would only make the Hitler regime more desperate. But what the boycott could have done is possibly, in its early stage, uh, had an impact on some of the policies. And we see it did have an impact. Because without the boycott, there would be no transfer agreement. The only reason the Nazis felt compelled to negotiate with their enemies, the Jewish nationalists, was because this boycott was a weapon that the Nazis, in their mythical confusion, actually feared. On the subject of the boycott, Joyce Nelson in New York, another reader asked, was the anti-Nazi boycott just a boycott of Jews, or was it bigger than that? It was way bigger than that. Uh, it, it was never called a Jewish boy. It was never called a Jewish boycott. Uh, it, uh, there were Catholics involved. Uh, some of the greatest uh, figures in the uh, uh, New York Arch Archdiocese and Boston Archdiocese were involved. The Polish were involved. Labor unions were involved. The Protestant community was in, in, in involved. Uh, the, the organizers of the boycott against the Nazis were very careful to sculpt this as not just a, uh, um, a, 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 a Jewish tragedy, but one which was threatening the world. You know what they say, the Jews first and everybody else second. And that's why they did it the way they did. It was extremely credi credible. But then when the Jewish organizations backed off the boycott because of the transfer agreement, it was left to a bunch of unsupported random people who for years walked up and down the streets with protest signs and still carried the torch. And I'm glad that they did. Both were necessary. We needed to protest the Hitler regime, and we needed to save the Jews. I am not, I am not unhappy that both occurred. Well, Kenneth Babu uh, in Fresno, California, a computer programmer actually asked a, a related question. Granted what you're saying about the importance of the boycott, he wonders, did the Zionists cooperate too soon and for too little. People need to understand the minute-to-minute -minute life in Nazi occupy in Nazi domination. He could be killed. He could be sent to a concentration camp. There was a limit to how far the Zionists could play their own cards. And the best card that they had the best card was that people over there who we can't control, these American Jewish organizations, are protesting by the hundreds of thousands and, and, and bankrupting your, your companies, which were falling by the, way, by, 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 by the wayside. And we have the ability to circumvent, to, to circumvent that. So from the Nazis' point of view, they were dividing the Jewish community with the transfer agreement, as well as serving all these other interests that I've discovered. No, they didn't um, uh, uh, do too little too soon. Uh, they did as much as they could as soon as they could. But they did it in a different set of modalities. A student in Berlin, Dennis Katz, asks, did the Zionists think that Jewish Palestine would be safe from the Nazis 
or were they afraid that given Hitler's designs on the Middle East as well that uh, that would also be a dangerous place? I think it was always understood by many that, uh, uh, that Hitler uh, thought of Palestine as a great big prison camp for the, um, a great big prison camp for the Jews. They'd be put there in Palestine and then they could take over over, over the Middle East. But uh, I think the Zionists thought, uh, let's save the Jews on Monday and we'll figure out what happens on Friday. You know, it's always been a Jewish aspiration. We don't want to be killed before Shabbos. Yeah. Well, let's finish with a, a last question from Joseph, uh, Joseph Myers, a retired teacher here uh, in Montreal. Uh, how did you work on the transfer, or how did your work on the transfer agreement affect you personally, and why is this one event in Washington your only event on this book when you speak so often on your other books? Well, it's an appropriate final question. Um, it affected me personally uh, in that it set me off on a uh, circumnavigation of the world of evil. And uh, um, as circumnavigating the world of evil and injustice against the Jews and other groups, the further I go, the more I end up at the same point. And I always end up where I started. Uh, so it's done that to me. Uh, as to why this is uh, my uh, only event, um, um, because I choose to. Well, I want to thank uh, Rabbi Weinblatt uh, for a stimulating discussion and uh, Edwin for a, a very important book, which even 25 years later, as you uh, say, uh, still cower, uh, covers and uh, offers a very powerful message for us. Thank, thank you. And thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks. Thank you, Mitch. Edwin Black is the author of many books, including IBM and the Holocaust, War Against the Weak, and Internal Combustion. He's the editor of The Cutting Edge News. For more information, visit transferagreement.com.